Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark David, founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. We're back in the Psychology of Eating podcast, and I'm with Brenda today. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Yeah, glad you're here. Glad we're doing this. So the idea is you and I haven't met, and we get to be together for a little bit of time and see if we can help you move forward in whatever you wish to work with around food and body. So if you could wave your mm-hmm. magic wand, if you had a magic wand that you could wave mm-hmm. and get whatever you wanted when it came to food, when it came to your body, what would that be for you? What's the big wish? I'd like to um, want to eat healthier all the time um, instead of you know often wanting the things I shouldn't eat um, in more than a moderate, uh, sorry, a, a sometimes fashion. Um, and I go through these cycles where I go really good and I lose weight and I get to where I'm comfortable. Now, I don't want to be stick thin or anything, but I get to where I'm comfortable in my own skin. And then something happens and all of a sudden I'm back two sizes bigger again. I don't really worry about weight, but I don't then feel comfortable in my body. So then I get angry with myself. You know, you start not liking yourself and in the, the industry, because I'm in the fitness industry, then I feel like I'm um, not a failure, but a maybe not who I should be um, mm. to empower my clients. What do you do in the fitness universe? Well, I'm actually a personal trainer. I've got my own studio. So we do Pilates and class all different sorts of fitness classes. Good for you. And yeah. how long have you been doing that? 25 years or so. Wow. That's a great yeah. way to stay engaged with your own body. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I am very, I'm fit and I'm very functionally fit, which is what my studio is all about. Yes. So that's not the issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so this pattern of, you know, you'll be at the weight you feel comfortable at, mm. and then all of a sudden something happens and you find yourself two sizes up. How, how long has that pattern been happening? Uh, I think most of my life, to be honest. Okay, so if we can, if if you could remember the earliest time, like was it when you were twenty years old, twelve years old, what what age roughly? I'd say my mid to early teens, because my mum used to put me on diets all the time because I was quite a chubby child, mm-hmm. um, and she would put me on diets all the time. And then when I wasn't on the diet, I thought, oh, I can eat this, and and then I'd balloon, of course, because I'd been dep- not deprived, but I'd been restricted on what I could eat and would only be able to eat what she gave me, which back in those days was limits biscuits, which was really horrible. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so that I think that started my cycle of and I've and I'm I'm aware of it now, but I wasn't for many, many years. Yeah. So I'm just trying to work out ways of getting it out of that cycle. Got it. So when you're Ooh. At the weight that or at the size you want to be at where you feel yeah. comfortable, what yeah. are you doing that helps you be at that size? Um, I've been able to focus more on, on what I'm eating um, and not, I think, I'm pretty sure I'm a bit of a, an emotional eater as well. So that, that uh, depending on what's happening to how that goes. But um, it can be either really sad or, or or having turmoil to being really happy. Because sometimes when you're really happy, you, you just go and you just eat because you're just happy and you just you know you don't worry about it. The other times when you're in turmoil, you eat from for comfort. So I think it's a two-edged sword. If that mm. makes sense. Mm. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah. You find yourself emotionally eating. It could be happy. It could be you're just, you know, going through something tough. Mm. And so when you're emotionally eating, do you, it sounds like you're reaching for different kinds of foods that you think that you say, well, these are not as good for me, not as healthy for me, or it's it's the same foods that you normally eat? No. And I look, I, I do have, you know, I have a glass of wine sometimes, I have some, you know, some nibbles and stuff, and I usually can just have them in moderation. But 
especially when I get really stressed, which I have been probably for the last year because I renovated my studio, which was a bit, very big stress because it was only supposed to be little and ended up humongous. But anyway, that's still another story. Um, yeah, I just found that I was reaching for an extra glass of wine at night. So like I wouldn't just have one with dinner. I might have two. And then with that, of course, once you have that, then you feel like, oh, I think I'll have a, some chips. I'll have a little nibble on those biscuits. So I think that's the the one of the triggers is not to have that at night too much. Not to have the extra alcohol. Yeah. And then the the food that comes on with it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're noticing your comfortability relative to your size, relative to your clothing size. Do you weigh yourself? I actually try not to. Mm -hmm. I have a um, a scanner that I have that that tells you your body fat and all that sort of stuff, which I prefer to sort of go a bit by that and then my clothing size rather than look at weight because, <clears throat> as you know, you know if you've got a lot of muscle mass, you can weigh a lot heavier. So I don't tend to worry about the weight as such. Got it, but more so yeah. size. Size, okay. yeah. Okay, and when you say you feel more comfortable at a certain size. Mm -hmm. Can you just like say a few more, like like what feels better? Like how do you feel different? I just feel that um, I like myself more mm -hmm. because I feel more comfortable in my clothing. I don't feel like, you know, when I'm doing um, a, a certain exercise, my belly doesn't get in the way. And, you know, I just feel like I can do be who I say I am yes I think because of my job as well that I feel that I, I feel that pressure and that's a it's terrible that's the industry that we're in but um yeah do you notice do you notice that your business is worse when you're in your who sizes more than you want to be face do people and you know what it's actually not Actually, sometimes it's better because people can identify with my struggle um, and they're going through the same struggles. So they go, okay, well, I can go there. I can be comfortable. I can exercise and I don't have to worry about having a little skinny crop toppy person next to me, if that makes sense. Yes. And it's, No, that's great if people are like that, but some people especially... I have mostly older people from or from 35 on that, that that don't feel comfortable in that situation. Yes. So yeah. let's start right there for a moment. Let's just let's just mm -hmm. nip that one in the bud and yeah. say that, you know, this concern, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you didn't use these terms, but it's sort of like walking the talk. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing yeah. as a person in the fitness industry, because previously, and I'm using the word previously, what the, what the world has taught us is if you're going to be in the fitness industry, that means you have to be slender and muscular and look a certain way and be a certain yeah. size. So if that was the case, probably only one twentieth of the world would be working out and doing anything fitness wise or dance wise or fun. Um, and the rest of the human population would not be going to a class and trying to get fit because we don't have that body. Um, and to yeah. your point, <laughs> you said to me, you know, not only is business not worse when you're two sizes up, sometimes it's even better. And mm. I think you hit the nail on the head by saying, you know, people can relate more. They can relax mm. and they can feel I'm safe here. I'm not going to be judged. And Here's a woman who's not classically tiny and she's and she moves and she's teaching and she's in her body and she's as far as I can tell, she's feeling good about herself. Because yeah. here she is up in front of the room. Yeah. And that can be inspiring. So all I'm saying is there's your new paradigm, there's your new model. Yeah. On the one hand, that sure you, you have your preference. You can say to me, I I want to be two sizes less and here's the size and the weight and the percent body fat I'm, I'm, that I want to be. So that's totally your choice. That's totally your preference. 
but I just want to make sure for you that what's motivating you or inspiring you to be there is not some made up nonsense mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, everybody's judging you and you're not being the right person. No, you're, you're actually doing people a great service by just being you. And sometimes you looks like this and sometimes it looks like this. And guess what? No matter what size you've been, you still come, mm -hmm. you still show up, you still teach, you're still functionally yeah. fit and you're still moving and you're still relatively healthy. You're alive. Mm, Looking exactly. Good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so really you can let that go. You can let go that piece of this is what should be motivating me. Like I need to be a certain standard. Like, no, then you're, then you're cutting away all the people who wish to be in your class because it, they feel safe and comfortable. What if yeah. you were saying to your students, Hey, y'all got to be two sizes less in order for me to accept you into my class. Yeah. I know what David do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's kind of what you're saying to yourself. Yeah. That you yeah. to accept you, you have to be two sizes less to be teaching. Mm. You wouldn't say that to your students. No. Why say it to you? Yeah. I think in my head, I know that, but then, you know, it's a confidence thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's retraining your brain. Yeah. It's a confidence thing, but it's retraining your brain that when you go into that thought, oh, I'm not walking my talk. I'm not being the ideal fitness person. Oh, no, wait a second. That's not true. Mm. I'm actually doing something really good in the fitness universe. I'm helping people. I'm helping a good mm. number of people feel really good about themselves and feel comfortable and feel okay showing up in this class. Yeah. And, so I, and I did. That's what I wanted to, to bring is for everyone to feel comfortable no matter what size or shape they are, that great. they can come into a safe space and not be judged. So that's where you got to walk to talk then. Got to yeah. do it for yourself. <laughs> right? Yeah, true. Yeah. You got to do that part for yourself. If you're saying I'm doing that for other people, that's mm. where you want to walk the talk for you. And it's 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 a practice. Mm. Like showing up at class is a practice. Yeah. Showing up for yourself and in your thinking and changing your thinking, that's a practice. Okay. Yeah. So far as I can tell, given given the the dilemma you've posed, here's the here's the dilemma. So since my early teens, when, you know, my mom started dieting me, and by the way, this is unfortunately not an unusual story. No. My parents starts dieting me from a young age. So from a young age, we're conditioned, oh my goodness, if I don't lose weight, the big people in this world, my i.e. the parents, the older people, the people taking care of me, they don't love me, they don't approve of me. And apparently other people won't love me and approve of me because this is really important. So I got to lose this weight. Yeah. So here you are, you're a young person, you're, you're eating this restrictive diet. And the moment you're off the diet, what's any young person going to do? You're going to party. <laughs> hey, whatever they can. Right, you're going to celebrate. So then you're going to go to the opposite of where you just were because yeah. you were kind of being put in a food and body prison. So the natural tendency, as soon as you're let out of food and body prison, is mm. you want to have a little bit of fun and pleasure because you've been restricted and not allowed to kind of be a person and a young person, mm. a person who mm. can just naturally be in your joy with food. Mm. So, you know, I, I always think our, our parents are doing the best that they can, not, not blaming your mom, not blaming anybody else. You know, she, she did the best that she could. So, so, but that's been a pattern now. So even though your mom doesn't put you on a diet anymore, so your mom's not saying every day, you know, okay, Brenda, cracking the whip. Here's what you got to eat. <laughs> yeah. But there's this part of you that you've taken over her job. It's, and you're watching yourself like your mom would watch you. Okay, no, 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 no. We got to eat like this. But then as soon as it gets a little too much, and by too much mean, you know, life gets a little tough sometimes, or we're mm -hmm. emotional people. And yeah. We're emotional people. So when emotion happens, positive or negative, happy or sad, a lot of times we reach for food. Mm. And then you kind of sort of feel bad about yourself. 
Yep. So in a way, when you are reaching for food, when you're emotionally eating, it's almost like you're that, you're that 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girl again. Yeah. Because when you ate food, when you were off the diet, when you were in your teens, in a strange way, that was a form of emotional eating. You're celebrating, you're happy, and you're eating because, wow, well, I can eat now. But also, you know, part of you might be feeling sad because, ouch, that hurt. Ouch, I had to be on a diet. This is difficult. And, you know, young people are emotional and we go through a lot. So it's all kind of mixed in together. The good emotions, mm -hmm. the challenging emotions. So all you learn from a young age, as soon as I have a, a sense of freedom, or as soon as I have a good reason, I'm going to eat. Because eating makes me feel like, oh, I can celebrate. Oh, I'm off the hook. And I'm not under the whip anymore. And I can just be me. Mm. So two choices that I see. One, you could either just say, okay, I accept myself. And this is the pattern. I go up two sizes. I go down two sizes. And you just do the pattern and you accept it. That would be reasonable. And mm -hmm. the other thing is, you know, something, this is a lifelong pattern. Mm, I don't think I want to do it anymore. Let's change it. That's harder. That's harder uh -huh. work. Because obviously you would have changed it already if it was easy. Yeah. If it was yeah. easy, you would have done it. Yeah. And I do for a while, but then, yeah, I fall back into. Yeah. So that's the pattern. <laughs> You're yeah. able to do it for a while. Just like you were able to diet when you were younger. You were able to lose yeah. some weight. You were able mm. to control yourself. And then all of a sudden you can't anymore. And mm. uh, you don't really want to anymore. Um, so then here comes the food. And here comes more body size. So to change that means, I think, we have to dig a little deeper to the origin like we've been doing so you can see where that pattern comes from. Mm -hmm. There's a part of you that needs to move out of your mom's house. <laughs> That's a good, good figure of speech, that one. Yeah. Part yeah. of you needs to move out of your mom's house because there's a part of you that's still living there. You're being your mom when you make your food rules and you're being young you, young Brenda, when you're breaking the food rule. And you mm -hmm. have a glass of wine and you have a little bit of this and you have a little bit of that. You kind of loosen up and it sort of feels good. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Yeah, true. Yeah. If it didn't feel good, you wouldn't do it. Emotional eating feels good. We emotionally eat because food helps us regulate our emotions. Emotional eating is not a bad thing. We're emotional creatures. We mm -hmm. eat at birthday parties. We eat on a dinner date. We eat when we celebrate, we eat at a holiday. And you know what? There's times when I have a bad day and things are rough. And if I have a favorite meal, a favorite dessert, I feel good. If you have a pet, you have a dog, you have a cat, when they're hungry, they don't feel good. No. As soon as they eat, they feel happy. They're playing afterwards. They're feeling good about themselves. So food regulates yeah. our emotions. So there's nothing wrong with that intrinsically, it just gets problematic when it gets out of our control. When food is the only tool, really, or it's the best tool that we have to regulate our emotions. So I think what your task is, is to look at what else can I do other than food? So instead of attacking the emotional eating, Oh my God, I'm an emotional eater. I better stop emotionally eating. No, you will, we, we will be humans who eat for the rest of our lives. We will be emotional beings for the rest of our lives. Eating and emotion go together mm -hmm. in a natural way. And emotional eating can be problematic when we're doing it too much. And it's the only strategy we have to be with our emotions. So your job which you couldn't do when you were younger because you were too young is mm. to learn how do I 
how do I work with my uncomfortable feelings, my negative feelings? Mm -hmm. I'm stressed. I'm anxious. How do I be with that other than turn to food? So, so let me ask you the question, what else in life do you do that you could think of that helps you feel good other than eat food that helps you kind of de-stress? Good question. So I'm usually working. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I get a really good sense of, a, I don't know, it makes me feel really, you, the warm and fuzzies if I can help my clients. I, I mean, that's sort of how I'm driven. So if I can help them overcome some challenge, I feel it makes me feel really good. So if I yeah. can help a family member or um, anybody. Yes. Okay. Got it. So you work a bunch and work helps mm. you feel good. Helping another human being, mm. helping yeah. them to feel good, makes you feel good. Great. We have to find things that you can do in the comfort of your own home when you get home from work, mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're out of the studio. And there's the part of you that, that is conditioned to turn to food to deal with emotions. Mm. Yeah. So you have to figure out what else can I do when I'm in the comfort of my own home? And I'm not going to be helping people in that moment because I've been doing that all day. Yeah, true. Yeah. So what else can you do? Examples, listening to music. Example, taking a shower. Example, uh, getting online and looking at fun videos that you like. Um, example, calling up a friend that helps you relax. Um, anything you can think of that you can do that helps bring down your stress temperature, helps bring down your anxiety. Anything come to mind? Watch a good comedy movie. I like I like watching them when I get time. Mm -hmm. Um I started my granddaughter makes me very happy. Um so I started um making some clothes for it because I haven't done it for a long time. So you do your knitting or um both knitting and um sewing. Oh. So so working with your hands, mm -hmm. creating something for somebody that you love. Yeah. Like that. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Emotional eating for many of us becomes a habit. When I say mm -hmm. the term habit, I'm more thinking of an unwanted habit and unwanted habits. I just smoke too much. Unwanted habits. I eat when I'm tired. I eat when I'm stressed. I eat when I'm bored. I eat when I'm anxious and I'm mad. And I even eat when I'm happy. So those are automatic, repetitive, unconscious habits. We just mm. do that. We don't even think to do it. So you've been doing that habit since you were young. You don't have to think to yourself when you come home from the studio, you know something? I'm ready to de-stress a little bit and I'm just going to have some wine or something to drink and then I'm going to nibble and then I'm going to snack some more and I'm just going to eat. You, you don't have to remind yourself of that. No. You don't have to make yourself do that. You're no. automatically doing that and the decision is, be, is coming beneath your awareness. So what I'm saying is in order to change that, in order to change a habit that's automatic and repetitive and unconscious, it just does itself. We have to introduce consciousness. We have to shine a light on it. Mm -hmm. We have to say, oh, huh, wait a second. I'm about to do this unconscious habit that I normally do without even checking in with myself. We have to interrupt that habit. Oh, I don't really wanna do this. Why? Because I feel like being two sizes less. That's why. And oh, what else? I just can't say I'm not going to eat because that's too hard. Mm, that's all right. That's silly. You've got to replace it with something. So homework assignment for you. I really want you to think. We've already come up with a few ideas. Watching a comedy movie. Watching a comedy show. 
getting out the sewing, the knitting. And here's what I'm going to do in the moment that I would normally reach for food. Yeah. So replace it with a, a better habit. Yes. Or a number of habits that you can pull off of your little menu, your menu of five or six different things that you yeah. can do. Hmm. And it doesn't mean you eliminate all eating. It just means you're aware of how much you're eating because you've said to me, you know, yeah, I normally might have a glass of wine or, or might have a drink, but then I might have a second one. And then that might loosen me up to have something else and something else and something else. So you have to introduce awareness like, oh, I'm doing this habit that I said I didn't want to do. Yeah. And the reason why we generally don't do that is because it's it's kind of work. <laughs> it's work to do that. Mm. And you've just been working all day, even though work is fun for you. You want to relax. Mm. And this is the cost of changing an unwanted lifelong habit. Mm. Is there's work in it. There's 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 practice, there's effort, there's consistency in it. Yeah. That's why I said at the beginning, word, isn't it? yes, that's why I said at the beginning, it's either accept that you have this pattern or roll up the sleeves and you've got to get to work a little bit. Yeah. And I've just been laying out for you in my experience, what the work looks like. Yeah. Especially as it relates to emotional eating. Yeah, that's right. How's all this landing for you so far? What's tell me? Tell me how you're sort of processing all of this. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're saying everything that I I know I should do, mm -hmm. and when I focus on it, I do it, and then we get slack, of course. Um, stress, more stress comes in. Just I know this last twelve months has been extremely stressful, but um. You know, then you just you just do, don't you? You go, oh my god, I've had such a hard day. I'm just going to have a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. you know, I deserve it because I've had such a horrible day. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what I need to start thinking. Well, I deserve to have be comfortable in my own skin. I deserve more than just I've had a hard day. I deserve a glass of wine. Yes. Love that. That's such a great Sorry. reframe. That's a great reframe. The key for you is to realize mm -hmm. is, is to realize that you're adopting new strategies. This is not about yeah. you denying yourself. When you were young, your young mind accurately registered, I am being denied. Yeah. Limitations are being placed on me that don't feel so good. I'm being denied. Yes. So there's a part of us, there's a young part of us, but I don't want to be denied. Don't tell me I can't eat food. Don't tell me I don't deserve to feel good from wine or snacks. Like, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. So yeah, what I want to hear is I deserve to feel good. And you do. Yeah. And, and a, the biggest part of feeling good for you from what you're telling me is being in a body that you feel comfortable at. Yeah, exactly. So you deserve that. And because you deserve that, you deserve to be able to have other habits you could reach for in the moment that can replace excess food and excess wine. Mm. Yeah. And then that's, that's your new practice. Yes. And you know something, there's going to be some days where you just, it works and you get it down and you're so proud of yourself. And there's going to be other days where like, no, it's been a really rough day. I deserve some wine and you're going to go for the wine. And when that happens, I just want to say to you, the key is forgive yourself. Remember that you're not perfect. Nobody is. You're human. Everybody is human. And yeah. then you begin again the next day yeah I think I need to be more accepting of myself like I am of other people ah that's so good yeah so I accept that 
they're not perfect and I try and help them do everything I can. So I need to then accept the same in myself. Yes, that is, that's a sign of wisdom when you actually can give to yourself so many of the gifts that you give to other people. Yeah. You give your students the gift of being non-judgmental. You give them a safe space. You're not, you're not looking at them and criticizing them and critiquing them. You're looking at them and going, hey, come on into class and let's move and let's feel good. Yes, exactly. So that's so. So this is your time to do that for you. You know, it's mm-hmm. what what helps me do that is in the moment when I realize I need to treat myself like I treat other people. I invoke that feeling. I remember what it's like. I'll think of an instance where I'm supporting somebody. I think of an instance where I help somebody feel really good about themselves. And I think in that moment, how I, I invoke that feeling. Oh, that makes me feel so good when I help another person. Mm. So you literally bring up that feeling in the moment and go, oh, so you're already starting to feel it in relation to another person. And then you say to yourself, ah, that's the feeling I want to aim at me. Yeah. Exactly the feeling. Well, I think you I think you have some good mm. you have a good little roadmap here. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just I, yeah. Think, I think it might also be helpful just in your own way. This might mean journaling, or it just might mean giving it some thought to really remember what it was like for you as a young person in your early teens to be restricted and then to have that sense of freedom and eat and notice how that part of you is still living inside you. Yeah. Yeah. And begin to be a better parent for yourself than your parents were. So instead of bad girl, you ate this, you shouldn't eat that. No, no. it's like you, you, you always love your child. You always forgive them. You always look to uplift them and give them some inspiration. Yeah, you want to give them guidelines, but give yourself good guidelines. Give yourself good structure, mm. Mm. Healthy, yes. healthy guidelines, healthy structure, like the kind we're talking about, learning how to catch yourself when, oh, I'm about to use food to excess food to regulate my emotions. What else can I do in this moment to help me feel good, to help me feel centered, to help me feel balanced? Yeah. Funny thing is I actually teach my clients to do those sort of things. Oh, great. You know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking voice. about. <laughs> you know oh, exactly what I'm thing. talking about. Yeah, life comes full circle sometimes, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. So, yes, teach them to have better habits that when you go to eat something, what can you do? And it just sort of hit me. That's that's what I teach them. So um, why aren't I taking my own advice? Yeah, because often, you know, sometimes we're the last person to take our own advice. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle of the path. Doesn't matter doesn't matter. It's it's just here you are learning it. I, I think that part of it is we oftentimes teach what we need to learn. It's true for me. Yeah. M- much of what I teach, I need to learn. And it's a great way to learn by teaching. Yes. Yeah. So you're constantly hearing the message. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Good work, Brenda. Thank you. You feeling good about the conversation? I am. It just sort of put things into pers- perspective, I suppose, for want of a better word. It just sort of put put things into place more in my mind that, um, yeah, I need to be kinder to myself. And, um, yeah, that the, the care I give to my clients, I should be giving to myself. 
as well. So, yeah. I think you got some 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 good homework, some good practices. Yeah. Good perspective here. Yeah. Thanks for being in this conversation with me, Brenda. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day and your evening. And yeah. take care, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for coming by, everyone. Hey friends, we're so happy that you've joined us for another episode of The Psychology of Eating with Mark David. Are you loving these episodes? Then simply subscribe and you'll never miss an episode again. We'd also love it if you'd leave us a comment below so we can hear more about your own journey with food and body. And if you're curious about what we offer at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating, including our internationally acclaimed coach certification training that's rooted in dynamic eating psychology and mind-body nutrition, please head on over to our website, psychologyofeating.com. Until next time, take care. And remember, having the body you want starts with loving the body you have.